first webinar of our 2021-22 series. Um, Jeremy and I are going to kick it off tonight with a little bit of mystery argument writing, which is kind of perfect since it is October. <laughs> um, so Jeremy and I uh, created this. We've been part of the Chippewa River Project uh, writing project for quite some time. Um, and we're really excited uh, that you're here tonight. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Jeremy, since you kind of have our like writing into the day. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Uh, so we just uh, wanted to start off tonight by having you in the chat um, talk about or write about what is your definition of argument and what definition do you think your students might give you for argument? Um, and, you know, please go ahead and feel free to answer in the chat and you can introduce yourself in the chat too. You can just say who you are, what grade you teach, and then you can give your definition. So we'll give you, you know, two or three minutes to do this and uh, we'll kind of come make some comments on what you're thinking and uh, we'll move into uh, to, uh, our, the heart of our presentation tonight. I know for me, you know, when I was in the classroom and I'll talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more and give formal introductions here in a minute. I know that my students would have always said that it's when two people fight. So when there's some kind of yelling and screaming and arguing. Um, my students always talk about um, the presidential debates. Um, they get really excited for those, um, especially the last couple of years they've been, I guess, more entertaining to um, the students than they have in the past. So um, they would probably talk about an argument being like an official debate. What are some other thoughts that our, our participants have? Go ahead and pop those into the chat. What is your definition of argument? What definition do you think your students will have for the definition of argument? Hopefully you guys can see my screen and you, you see that prompt. Yep. Well, while people are populating the chat, I'll uh, drop a, a note in here. I, I think <laughs> as I was teaching middle school writers um, and trying to introduce the idea of creative and persuasive essay, I would have thought that argument was prove your point, offer a quick counterpoint, and then wrap it up at the end. And what I've come to understand over many years, and especially through National Writing Project work with their College Career and Community Writers Program, the C3WP, I love this phrase, debatable, defensible, and nuanced. And when we think about argument as a conversation and not as a battle, uh, I think it opens up new possibilities. So I see there's some more people in the chat that might want to chime in though too. Yeah. Troy, you got some uh, you got some love here from Kara. She was uh, yeah. <laughs> leave some quotes from your nature of argument in the digital world text. Oh. Um, she says argument writing requires students to make intentional choices about what they want to say as well as how they choose the media in which they say it. Thank you. Appreciate the shout out. <laughs> I would say too that definition of you know students again and, and through no fault of their own you know thinking about what mm -hmm. it is and how uh, we are typically taught about opinion writing. It is you know I'm presenting my opinion. I'm bringing in sources to back up my opinion, and I'm trying to prove why I'm right. Um, so like Jeremy was saying earlier, like it's a fight and only one side or the other wins. It's not necessarily to come to a new understanding. It's to have somebody emerge as the winner. So, yes, yes. My student, my students always, always has, had always felt that way that there had to be a winner, you know, in an argument, um, you know, no matter what. <laughs> I see some words here. I'll borrow from Grant, this idea of a civil dialogue versus an uncivil dialogue i think is important to bring out here yeah well great to hear from all the pre-service teachers tonight wonderful yeah, yeah thank you so much there's so many good good thoughts um in this chat right now blowing my mind yeah i i like what zach had said too uh where he says i believe it's an argument is a logistical presentation of your point i really like that uh definition uh, Lots of connections to debating. Oh. So, well, thank you so much for, for putting some of those in the chat. Um, as we uh, continue to move forward our presentation, we want to value your time. Um, so Troy, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can talk a little bit about the, the slides that you had uh, put into our presentation tonight. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. So again, welcome everyone to our first webinar in our 2021-22 series. Thanks to Becky and Jeremy for coordinating. 
And we're going to take just a moment uh, to uh, read part of our land acknowledgement. Uh, we have a social justice action planning group as part of the Chippewa River Writing Project. And uh, their first project has been to develop this land acknowledgement statement. So I'll read the first paragraph and welcome you to read the rest as well. The Chippewa River Writing Project is based at Central Michigan University, located in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Founded in 1892 as Central Michigan Normal School, CMU is located on the ancestral grounds of the Council of Three Fires, the Anishinaabe, of whom the Saginaw Chippewa Nation is one. Seated under duress in the 1855 and 1864 treaties, this land was named the Isabella Indian Reservation and remains part of the homeland of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe. And if you'd like to learn more about how we composed uh, that uh, land acknowledgement, we can get you in touch with some of the teachers that were part of that process. It was really meaningful for all of us. And then on the next slide, I'll just offer another brief uh, service announcement here. Um, all of the webinars this year are being brought to you uh, for free at no charge. Uh, the teachers that are presenting are doing this as just a service to the profession and to our pre-service colleagues. We appreciate you being here. Um, for those who are able and might be inclined to do so, we would welcome you to make a donation at giving.cmesh.edu as our writing project is supported right now only through grants and outside professional development work. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Becky and Jeremy. And uh, not only are they the series hosts, they are tonight's uh, webinar hosts as well. So I'll <laughs> let them take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Becky start just because, you know, it's ladies first. That's the way it should be. I love it. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so he's usually not this nice to me. It must be because <laughs> of the webinar series. So um, I am Becky Schwartz. I'm one of your co-facilitators of the webinar series. Um, Jeremy and I put this presentation together tonight. Um, we are both TCs uh, for the Chippewa River Writing Project. I have been since 2015. Um, I'm a high school English teacher in Springport Public Schools, um, which is in Jackson County. It's a very small rural district. Um, in my career, I have taught all the way um, from seventh grade to 12th grade at various portions of that time. Um, so I have kind of a breadth of experience, uh, not as much in middle school as Jeremy, which is why um, he is the middle school master. Um, and I am, I am the high school teacher who just size and says middle school people. Um, all right, uh, with that, Jeremy, I'm gonna let you take it over. I don't know if I'd call myself a master because I don't think middle, middle school students can be mastered, but thank you, I appreciate <laughs> that. So um, my name is Jeremy Heiler. Uh, I am a TC uh, for the Chippewa River Writing Project. I have been part of the writing project since 2010. Um, and it has been one of the most wonderful experiences that I've ever been through. And uh, I truly owe a lot to Troy and to all of the TCs and to all of the colleagues that I work with because it truly is a home away from home um, when we need it in our professional lives. Um, I am a former middle school English teacher. I was in the classroom for 22 years before just recently taking a position uh, with the Center for the Collaborative Classroom. Uh, you can check out their website uh, by just Googling Center for Collaborative Classroom. We offer a uh, a lot of different uh, curriculum for schools. And uh, I, my official title for them is manager of educational partnerships. So uh, I get to do a lot of stuff, kind of like what I'm doing tonight with Becky and get paid for it. So, which is kind of cool. Um, and there's some other things that go along with it as well. Uh, if it looks like I'm looking at two screens, it's because I have dual monitors and it's just easier for me to look over at the presentation screen. Uh, so I'm not ignoring you. I promise I'm not playing like backgammon or anything on my other screen um, or solitaire. Uh, I am actually paying attention. <laughs> so with He's really just bragging about his dual monitors. Oh, I, I'm telling you what, if you don't have it, go for it. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> Um, so as we continue to think about this idea of argument, um, one of the things that I wanted to bring into this, uh, because this is where I started my journey with argument, uh, which was uh, with the late George Hillix, uh, with Teaching Argument Writing, a phenomenal book. Uh, I do highly recommend it to any of the pre-service teachers that are here. Um, and he just said argument is at the heart of critical thinking and academic discourse. Um, I really think that in order for our students to uh, dive more, uh, more critically into their thinking, we need to have uh, lots of debates and we do need to have lots of opportunity for them to, to argue points, but we also need those opportunities for them to be able to uh, investigate uh, different points of view. 
uh, especially in the world that we live in today and looking at both sides. Uh, I know that Troy has one of the most wonderful presentations uh, and activities uh, that he did with my students uh, when I was in the classroom. Um, and he can probably, I know he could do a presentation on that alone, but, um, you know, forcing our students to really think critically about both sides uh, of the coin is important for them. Um, and then kind of what counts as arguments and uh, in the book, Teaching and Learning Argumentative Writing in High School English Language Arts Courses, um, I had put this uh, classrooms, I had put this quote in here uh, more because I was thinking of Becky and what she does in her classroom. Um, and you can read the quote here. I'm not going to insult anyone's intelligence by reading the quote. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to pull out um, in terms of, you know, what is given is that first line is just like what counts as argument of writing indeed what counts as argumentation more generally is not a given um, and i think that's one of the things that we have to talk to our students about um, that it's not a given and i think the other thing that kind of goes in relation to what this quote is saying is that um, we also need to tell our students that writing an argument piece is not easy um, it's not something that's going to come easy for them. It's not easy for adults. It's not going to be easy for middle school students. And it's not going to be easy for high school students. And even if we're starting to talk about like some, the, the other term that's used often in elementary, which is persuasive essay, you know, being persuasive can be just as difficult as writing an argument piece. So we're going to kind of kick it off and talk a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about the history of where I come from. And I know that Becky's going to talk a little bit about uh, her history as well. Um, after I uh, spend a few minutes, but um, really where this came out of was the George Hillock's book, and he talks about some things that he did with his students with this other book called Crime and Puzzlement uh, by Lawrence Tree, and you can find different editions of this book on Amazon. Uh, it's a great book. Um, it's something really for a rainy day. If you want to sit down and just do it yourself on a rainy day and try to solve some mysteries, you can do that. Um, but I was really looking for in my own classroom, looking for ways to engage students with argument writing for middle school because I was having difficulty with the traditional of, oh, hey, should you have school uniforms or should you not have school uniforms? Should cell phones be allowed in the classroom or should cell phones not be allowed in the classroom? Those were kind of cliche topics that students typically write about all the time. And so mm -hmm. I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole with them. So I was looking for different ways to approach this. Uh, and thankfully, you know, going through the writing project to so the Summer Institute and, and uh, with the Chippewa River Writing Project, I found some resources with the George Hillocks book, and it led me to what I'm going to be talking to you tonight that I've done with my middle school students in the past. I'm going to turn it over to Becky, and she's going to talk a little bit about her history, and then I'm going to get into the activities that I do with my middle schoolers. Yeah, um, so, and again, um, echoing some of what Jeremy said here, I really encourage you pre-service teachers very early in your um, time in the classroom to try to find a professional development group like the Writing Project or some people that you can very easily share resources and ideas with. Um, before I had done the Summer Institute and become a TC with um, Triple River, I attended one of their conferences um, and Jeremy presented on crime and puzzlement. And at that time I was still in my first year teaching. So I was kind of like, okay, this is really fun. I'm gonna put this away and log this away. Um, and I hadn't done it in my classroom. And then finally now in my eighth year of teaching, as I was preparing to try to address some of the skills gaps that exist in my students um, with COVID and the shutdowns and remote learning and all the other things that are going on right now, um, I was looking through some past notes, looking for something that was kind of non-threatening, a little more low stakes that I could start with for argument writing with them. Um, and I came across this presentation that Jeremy had done and I was like, it's brilliant. Um, and so I have adapted it for my high school classroom that I just completed this fall with them and it has been a huge success. So, um, you know, it's about sometimes not always using the stuff that you learn in PD immediately. It's about logging away so you have as many resources as you can for, you know, the inevitable rainy day or when you get to that point where you're like, I really need to start with the basics again. Yeah, and one of the things I want to add to what Becky said is just what she just kind of echoing exactly what she said, which is she adapted it to her classroom. So our hopes are whatever 
I present to you or whatever Becky presents to you, what, which I know she's going to present to you, um, that that uh, you you adapt it to your, this is not the end all be all. This is not perfection. This is just what's worked for our students. And we hope that you can take some bits and pieces of my presentation, uh, Becky's part of her presentation, and you can, you can use it in your own classroom uh, and with your students because uh, it has worked for us. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about what I do with my middle schoolers. I gave you the background already. Um, so um, one of the things first I want to kind of frame this is that um, I have my students do some argument writing through collaboration um, with this particular activity that I'm doing with them. Uh, prior to this, uh, students are typically reading nonfiction articles and looking at viewpoints from different sides. Um, they're trying to pick out vocabulary. They're trying to pick out uh, different types of evidence that might be uh, within the articles that they read. Uh, so we've had some conversations prior to this, but um, writing is hard. And it, you know, just like I echoed earlier before, um, and so I want my students to feel confident in terms of what it is that they're doing. And so I feel like giving them an opportunity to write an argument paper together would be an awesome, awesome experience for them to build that confidence. Um, and also it opens up that idea of uh, creativity. And then some of you had already talked in the chat about the debate part of argument. When you have them work in a collaborative setting with the type of unit that I'm doing with them, this also gives some room for them to have healthy debate about what's going on in some of the, the pictures that we're one of the pictures that we're going to show you from crime and puzzlement. Um, it also prepares them for real world employment. So let's face it, you're, you're going to be working together with individuals. And yes, you, uh, believe it or not, you're going to be working with people that you don't like. And I tell them, I, I have always told my students that. And so you're going to have to just kind of, you know, suck it up and you're going to have to work with some individuals that you may not like, but you got to find what are the qualities that they possess that they can bring to the table and help you out um, with things. And then we all have weaknesses in writing. And like I said, writing's hard. We all have these weaknesses. And so I always tell students, if you're not very good with grammar, then find someone in your group that can be very good at checking for grammar mistakes or spelling or punctuation or word choice or revising, moving those pieces around. So um, again, playing on each other's strengths and trying to make the best piece possible when it comes to this writing. So that is why I have my students do this together. So what are we going to do? What is the process? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to have you take a look at a crime scene tonight. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through the steps. And then I am Becky, if you could put them into just random breakout rooms for me, that would be fantastic. Um, and yeah. then, and then um, I'll talk a little bit more um, when we come back, but you're going to uh, make a, a copy of this of the Google Doc. And uh, I'm just going to pull up this Google Doc real quick, it, it automatically forces you to make a copy. Uh, of it. And what you're going to see is you're going to see something that looks like this. Hopefully you're still seeing my screen. It says things we notice and then what's the evidence. You're not going to try to solve this crime scene at all. And this is what I tell my students. You're not solving anything. So you got to get it out of your head because the first thing that students are going to want to do, I know what happened. I know who did it. I don't want you thinking about that at all. What I want you to do is just simply in the left-hand column in this box, I want you and your group, whatever breakout room you're in, to write down the things you noticed. If you notice that there is a glass that's tipped over, write that down. If you notice there's a rip in the curtain, write it down. If you notice that there's a puddle on the floor, write it down. Anything that you notice. And so you're just going to collaboratively uh, write in this document. Now, it says to make a copy. And so what you might need to do is you might need to take a minute and share it with others. If you don't want to share it with others, maybe you could just have one person scribe while somebody else um, shares their screen. You can do it that way um, just for the sake of time. Um, going back to our presentation here uh, for just a minute. Um, what we're what we're looking at you doing is we want you to um, share the Google Doc, but you don't have to. We're going to give you about five to seven minutes to list anything that you need to know or that anything you notice. Once you're done creating your list, I want you to rewrite any of the things you notice that could be considered evidence. So um, <clears throat> to convict the to convict the killer or to convict the person that might be guilty. So basically, I want you to prioritize your list. So almost think of it as if you go grocery shopping. So you write out your list 
right away of all the things that you need. And then maybe you prioritize that list by the aisles, you know, so you make it, you know, in terms of I got to go to aisle one, aisle two, aisle three. And I always tell, I've always told my students that um, to make it more efficient. So what are the important things? You know, if there's a butterfly that you notice floating around the room, maybe that butterfly is not so important. So you wouldn't put it over onto your, the right hand side of that document that I showed you. Now, this part of the activity takes about 15, 20 minutes with students. We're only giving you about five to seven minutes just for the sake of time. And like I said, we're going to put you into some breakout rooms and then we'll meet back and we'll debrief a little bit. But like I said, don't try and solve the crime yet. What questions do you have for me before I put you into breakout rooms? Becky, am I missing anything? Troy, is there anything you want to add just so that um, I'm clear on my directions? Because sometimes I can ramble. Jeremy, where's the crime scene that they're looking at? Um, I, put that in the chat? I thought that was the same one that you had, you were using. Can we use that one? Possibly. Yeah, absolutely. I'll pop that into the chat um, in just a second here. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just was going to keep it consistent and use the same one that you were using. <laughs> uh, perfect. Okay. I'm going to pop that link into the chat and then I will um, take a second and send you to your breakout rooms. Thank you for your patience. And I might need to give the link to the Google Doc too that I can put into the chat. So there's that link to the document and then Becky's put the crime scene in there too. So. All right, and I'm gonna send you to your breakout rooms. Okay, we'll see you back here in about five, seven minutes. You felt about how you just made a simple list um, or the things that you noticed compared to what might be evidence. Uh, you can talk about that process with your group and how you felt about that. And as you're putting your, your input into the chat, um, what I'm going to do, I shared my screen with a, a Google document that you all have access to. Um, and uh, it's, it'll be on the next slide in our presentation. But what I wanted to show you is this is a student example. And what the student ex students did is they looked at a crime scene that was called dropout. And then they made their simple list. And this was just the things that they noticed. Um, so they have a little bit of a different wording up there in their heading. And then what they did is they took the, the simple list and they made it more into that significant list. Like I was talking to you guys about um, with comparing it to a grocery list, what's significant, what do I need to grab first, second, third. And what they did is they just used the cross, the strike through feature on Google Docs and they crossed things out that weren't relevant to forming a, a claim or what might not be pieces of evidence uh, for their crime scene. And so you can kind of see how this process worked with students. And then at the bottom, uh, what they did is that they made a claim in terms of that they thought that this person got pushed out the window. Now they had a little bit of a different crime scene than what you had, um, but you can kind of see this process. And so hopefully, you know, it was very quick and I understand you didn't have a lot of time, but with a half hour, well, we have a half hour left. Um, we got to make sure we get to Becky's part of this. But what I wanted to show you um, is a couple of things and I'm going to go back to our presentation here and kind of walk you through some, a little bit of the process that I go through, but they're looking at this crime scene and they're creating this collaborative list. And we talked about what is considered evidence. And then I also, what is important about this is I want students to kind of sit on this for, for 24 hours. And what I mean by that is after we get done with this unit or not this unit, this activity, we don't do anything else for, for writing for that day um, with this particular uh, unit. What I want them to do is I kind of want them to let this marinate and process a little bit. So what I encourage my students to do is use Google Keep because that's something that they can share with each other outside of class. And then I ask them to kind of think about what are some other things that they might be able to uh, notice when they're outside of school. So I ask them to go home, take a look at it. What are some other things? And they can go into a, uh, and keep track of things on Google Keep. If you want them to start there on Google Keep, you could have them start there instead of a Google document. Um, I like I like both um, just because that way they can collaborate with each other outside of the classroom. And this forces them to kind of keep thinking about things. We talked about critical thinking earlier on in, the, in uh, the presentation, and I want my students to constantly be thinking about what are some of the processes uh, of this crime scene in terms of what ha has happened. But what they're going to eventually do is they're going to create an outline together for their final draft that consists of the most crucial pieces of evidence 
and their reasoning for what piece supports their claim. And then they're going to work with their group or peer over time um, with their with their strengths um, so they can become more comfortable with the editing and revision process. And then they're going to create that collaborative piece. And I'm going to show you real quick um, what that collaborative piece looks like with students. And um, real quick, you can see that the next step with this would be talking about argument and counter argument with your students. Um, and that's what I have them do. And you can see the numbers next to this. And I wanted to point this out. This is where I we talk about what, is, what are significant pieces of evidence? What are some pieces of evidence that I'm going to include in my argument for what happened in their crime scene? And then we talk about, we spend some time or a day talking about counter argument as well. Um, and there are some resources at the end we'll talk about with C3WP um, that goes into a lot of argument writing pieces and talks about different types of arguments. Um, I'm sorry, different types of evidence that you want students to find. But then they would compose this piece together. And what I usually have my students do is I have them break it down to um, having one student maybe who's good at writing introductions. They could write the introduction with the claim in it. And then another student could write some of the body paragraphs. And then maybe who's really good at writing uh, the counter argument. Um, now, mind you, we haven't talked about rebuttal yet. So that would be another day that we would talk about rebuttal. Um, and then they would write a conclusion. So this is all a really a multi-step process the students go through, um, but it's really about the collaboration and trying to make argument writing a little bit easier. So I'm gonna leave you on my end of um, this presentation, I'm gonna leave you with this, this thought of, were you able to identify what happened in the crime scene? Were you able to figure out what happened? Could you solve it? Um, the people that you just worked with. And you don't have to answer it in the chat if you don't want to, but I'm just kind of curious. And maybe at the end, Becky, if we have time, we can see if anybody uh, might have been able to solve this uh, particular crime scene. Um, yeah. So we will have some time for questions at the end, but again, I want to honor time. So Becky has a chance to talk about the high school unit. And I know that it was super fast talking about the middle school. Uh, but if you do have any questions, feel, please feel free to pop them into the chat. So I, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Becky for the high school part of this. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so with the high school, um, if you want to go on to the next slide, it kind of all started with summer school this summer. Um, and uh, that's one of my favorite things to teach just because you really get one on one time with those students who really need it. Um, and when I was looking at the sophomores that were in my summer school classes, they um, were really struggling when we were trying to write an argument in summer school. They, they can find evidence. They're like, I know this is evidence that supports what I'm saying, trying to say, but they can't find a way to explain it in a way that helped their writing um, or connected it back to the thesis. It was just like reading their papers. It was just like, bam, here's this really awesome piece of evidence in the middle of the paper that, and you're kind of like, when you're reading it, you felt, I felt really discombobulated trying to read their papers. Um, and so I was like, I have to address this, even though these are like, and the kids in summer school are not always the best barometer. I, the more I thought about it, the more I was thinking, you know, these kids haven't had a normal school year since seventh grade. So this is time for me to take it back to the basics with um, argument writing and kind of look at what I can do with this. Um, and so that's where this kind of came about. Go ahead and go on for me, Jeremy. Um, so a lot of their papers would look like this, right? It's a sharp blade, there's blood on the blade, there's a knife and fingerprints. So the person was stabbed, which all makes sense logically, but there's no finesse there, right? It's, and, and you don't have like, how does this really prove it? It started to look really kind of um, vague uh, when I was starting to uh, look at their stuff. So when we did the mystery, if you wanna go on, Jeremy, um, I, and I'm gonna, skip through these next two slides pretty quickly just because we don't have the time to do this. But if I were to uh, have had time, and this is how I introduce it to my students, I would pass them out the mystery, the dropout mystery, go ahead, Jeremy. And I would have them at their tables answer the questions and focus on the blurb at the end of it. So Jeremy did a really nice job with the things you notice and like what those could be as evidence. I have them start with the, um, the story the questions, then they look at the picture and they try to solve those. And they're really excited about this because they want to be right. And that's kind of like what Jeremy and I have like always countered against with the argument. It's not about being right. It's about the logicalness of their argument. 
And we talk about this all the time with this. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, and we'll come back to this. We talk about this all the time with them. Detectives don't go into the room saying, yep, it was murder. Or, yep, it was this. They go into the room and look at the crime scene and look at what the evidence points to it. So there were some important clues in this mystery. There was the footstool, the torn curtain, the portrait, and the fire outside the window. So the fire outside the window provided an idea of something that was distracting or something that created kind of the opportunity, so to speak. So the woman got up to look outside, outside at the fire. Um, if you look at the portrait, you can see that she is short comparative to the rest of the room. Um, the torn curtain shows that there was some sort of struggle here. And the direction of the footstool being knocked over um, is a really important clue. If it had been knocked a different direction, um, it would have indicated she fell. That was a piece of planted evidence by the nephew. So the solution to this is it was the nephew and it was murder. Um, and of course, this is where in the room, some kids would be like, I told you so. And then they'd be, they're really excited and celebrating because they either found it or they want to argue with me further because you know, I, I'm the one who wrote this mystery. But anyway, they um, don't, they really want to get to the point. And I talked to them. It's not about if you were right or wrong. It's about what was the logicalness of your argument? Did you construct together a solid argument? Um, and then they feel a little bit better. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, so what does this look like in an overview in my class? So we would do that model exercise. And that would be one full almost class period by the time that they had time to discuss it. By the time we went through it question by question, we broke it down and did that together. And then I put my students in pairs um, and I give them their case assignments. And I tell them, you are now detectives, right? And I put their mysteries in envelopes with their names on them. I pretend to be the really mean, like police sergeant who hands out their cases. I try to do it as much, make it as much fun as I can for them without being cheesy because you know, they're high school students and they can only have so much fun in school. And if they have too much fun in school, that just, that just isn't right. Um, so pre-writing, um, then we jump to kind of similar to what Jeremy did, some T-charts that I'm going to show you in a second. And then we write the essay and I have them work in pairs. So they write the essay together and they're evaluated. Um, their grade is evaluated. There's a portion of it that is shared together. And then there's a portion that they are evaluated separately on. So it teaches them both that collaboration, but also there are different parts of it on how you're evaluated on your own. Go ahead and go on, Jeremy. Um, so this is the first one that they do. And again, I try to make it as authentic as possible without being cheesy because, you know, high schoolers are allergic to the cheese. Um, so when they discuss this, they have to answer all of their questions and then they start to pick out the three most important pieces of evidence and they list them on the left-hand column. And then they explain them. How does that piece of evidence really, really prove what they're trying to do? And that's where they construct their claim. So somewhere after they've done their evidence and their explanation, they do a claim, which becomes their thesis that is essentially like, so-and-so was murdered, so-and-so was kidnapped by the father, so-and-so, the diamonds were stolen by this, whatever it was, their mystery, they really clearly put that. And then I have them shortly after they have done that, usually the next class period. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, I have them do the counter argument. And again, this collaboration really pushes students and gives them the opportunity to do the counter argument without too much complication. They're already discussing 10 possible reasons about how this happened. Um, and they're, they've determined what is likely and unlikely in their conversations. So I tell them, what was the second possible explanation? What was the last one that you rejected before you came to the one that you chose as your claim? Write that down with the possible explanation. And then your counter argument is why the theory you went with was better, right? What about that theory overtopped this one or disproved this one for you? And they go ahead and um, they fill these out and then go ahead, Jeremy. Um, we get to the essay, and I have these linked in here for you. You can look at them on your own point. Um, probably the big thing that I wanted to talk about is the um, draft paper or the paper draft outline. Can you click on that one, Jeremy? Thank you. Um, so in the outline, okay, maybe this is not the one I want to do. Can you close out of this one, Jeremy? Sorry. Um, well, you go to the model mentor text. That's what I wanted. 
Um, mentor texts are something that I do with my students. And a lot of times I write my own mentor text for the unit that we're doing. It's a way to create it as authentic. So we talk about the questions and the evidence and the explanation. If you can scroll all the way to the end, Jeremy, um, kind of, I have a sample paper and we talk about each one of these steps. And I talk about the author decisions that I made with it, why I did it this way. Um, and then I ask them, what are some decisions that you're considering making in, their, in your paper? And they discuss this. Um, and a lot of times these conversations are me bouncing from group to group to group all over the place. So I look like I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off and I'm having these great conversations um, with them about their papers and they talk their way through the paper and they share the kind of, I, what I like to call, they share the lion's share of the work on this. Each one is responsible for their own section um, and they have to make it tie back together. Um, so you can go ahead and close out of this. And once they've created this paper, they turn it in, I give them some feedback and they are given time to adjust these. Um, papers, and then they're given their kind of final score with this. Um, and then after I have gotten their final papers, that's when I, we have a great half hour every single um, time where we go through and we look at each one of the mysteries and they kind of do an informal, like, well, here's what we thought happened. Um, and this is what we want, or, and this is what we thought happened based on these pieces of evidence. And then I read them the results. And uh, some of the kids like to tell me that they can now be, they can now confidently know that they can be detectives, which I thought was hysterical. Um, and then the other thing that uh, they said that they want to argue um, still that their their option was the better option. Um, so they're continuing this talk of argument with this even after they've figured out the correct answer. And I think that that really opens the door um, to kind of have this discussion with them that again, the argument is not about who's right. It's about coming to um, understand each other's sides, right? You made this point. You convinced us that yours was a possibility. It maybe wasn't the correct answer according to the book, but you've convinced us. This is more what argumentation is about. Um, so this has kind of created a huge skills jump for my kids. Um, it has also been a great confidence builder. Um, they're already starting to talk about how um, well, argument writing isn't so bad as long as you know what you what kind of evidence you have to support you in your corner. So they're already starting to talk about that piece on um, that collaboration process and engagement. Um, I don't know how much pre-service work some of you have done, but if you've ever seen a high school classroom at like eight o'clock in the morning, totally focused and active and awake and engaged, um, that's what you would have saw in my classroom uh, this week or the last week, last weeks as we were doing this. Um, and again, it's a huge foundational um, piece and it makes it relevant. It's something I can go back to with them and remind them, hey, this is a skill that we built in this unit um, and continue to work on, right? Think about the way you approached it in this paper and it gives them something that they were all successful on to reflect back on. And then the last piece is, right? Sometimes in the classroom, we have, we've all experienced this where an activity that you thought was going to take a really long time didn't take you as long as you thought you did. And you have this random like 20 minutes now that you don't know quite what to do with sometimes. This is a great sponge activity. Um, the kids are always asking me, when, when are they going to get another mystery? When do they get to do this again? So when there's a random 20 minutes, I can pull this book out off my shelf and we can put it under the document camera um, and they have a great time with it. So uh, this, like I said, rainy, like Jeremy said at the beginning of this rainy day activity, amazing opportunity in your classroom. Yeah. And a couple of things I wanted to add. Um, I really appreciated what Becky said about modeling. That was one of the things I didn't mention um, with, with what I, what I do, what I did in middle school. Um, I always took this crime and puzzlement and Becky just said it, she put it underneath the document camera and shared it. And that's exactly what I do with this first before we dive into groups is I go through and we model, I model it together. Um, you know, think, do the think aloud with them, you know, let them know what's going on in my brain um, as I'm going through this process and what are, you know, trying to get them to, to teach them to not solve a crime right away is, is almost impossible sometimes with middle yes. school students, um, probably with high school students as well. Yes. Um, so, 
um, it's important to model. So I'm glad Becky brought that up because I forgot to mention it. And the other thing I wanted to mention too, and the reason why I came back to this slide is because the 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 crime and puzzlement book, there is a story that goes along with this, the with the picture, and then there's also some questions. Um, and you can choose to share the story with your students, or you can choose to not share the story, uh, or the or the questions as well that go along with it. Um, I tend to give them the story with the um, with the uh, picture. Um, I don't share so much the questions because the questions can lead them to solving the crime, and so I usually leave the questions out until after they've written their paper, and then. And I allow them to go back to the question. So I just wanted to come back to, to this slide real quick and and uh, um, reiterate that uh, the book does have some some information. The book does provide the solutions too, in case you you can't solve it yourself, because <laughs> there are some some of them in there that are pretty difficult. Yeah, um, some of them come down to like looking at where the um, the cup is placed. Is it right? Are they right or left handed? And um, if you don't think logically like that all the time it's kind of like well that's okay <laughs> yes exactly um so um one of the things that we wanted to provide for you too is some more resources um i did write a blog I write, i'm a blogger for middle web um and so i posted a link here in the more info um, and you will have access to these slides. Um, we will be giving you access to these. Um, so you can click on, or you can just Google middle web too. Um, but um, um, there's a blog post on, on this activity and co doing collaborative writing with students. Um, and a shameless plug for the book Troy and I wrote, Create, Compose, Connect. I go through it more detail in that book as well. And then um, I don't know, Troy, I'm, I'm disconnected with the, the C C3WP. I haven't done it in a couple of years. Um, I don't know if you want to mention uh, anything about that in terms of the argument writing piece, which I think is really critical because the work that I did with it, which has probably been about five, six years ago, was really beneficial for my classroom, especially when it came to um, writing evidence and counter arguments. So I'll just give a chance for Troy to speak up on this. Thanks, Jeremy. Actually, I'm going to defer for a moment to Cara if she'd like to take okay. the mic because she made a note in the chat about how she might extend your unit here, but yeah, I'll pull up the C3WP website and uh, be ready to screen share in just a moment. So Cara, I'm not sure if you'd be interested in sharing your idea here for just a moment. I mean, I think Becky um, gave me the idea because I was thinking in my head, oh my gosh, can I really write, you know, this well? And then I thought, oh, well, what if we take snippets from, you know, Raymond Chandler or, you know, um, Sherlock Holmes, or I mean, I'm even teaching Frankenstein. There's a lot of mysteries to be solved in there, yeah. and you know. And then we could apply these skills, and they could have that similar kind of thing. And then I was also thinking they could, you know, they could. I I, I have a drama background, so I, I love when they, you know, they play the authors or they play the characters, and yes. they could do like hot seating, you know, where you you put um, Victor Frankenstein you know, in the middle of the class, and he has to construct his argument, and then everyone else has to have their counter arguments. So that's yeah. awesome. As I never would have yeah. thought of it if you hadn't given this presentation. Ah, that's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to steal screen sharing from you for just a moment here, sir. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the College Career and Community Writers Program, also known as the C3WP, <laughs> used with the Chippewa River Writing Project, which is a CRWP, um, is a full set of curricular resources that are available free uh, from the National Writing Project. So we'll make sure to drop this link into the chat. And um, one of the things that I would point out from C3WP is um, that if you just need a place to get started, like, wow, what, I need some prompts, I need some ways to get going, um, you can dig in and start with this routine argument writing. And they give you a few different ideas. There are just some sample writing prompts that you can draw from, and even some sample lessons. So this is a really good entry point into the C3WP curriculum. But then what's amazing is that when you really want to start digging in more deeply, both at the upper elementary level and then at the middle and high school level, they have quite literally dozens of instructional units on here. So you go in 
and you're like, wow, all right, well, what would I like to do? How, how do I start? So someone earlier had mentioned like civil and civic discourse. Boom, there's a unit on that. Um, there's that routine argument writing again, um, annotating audio and video evidence. So if you're going to be using YouTube clips or podcasts or things like that, how might you have students use different forms of media as evidence? And so again, you can jump right in. You can find many, many, many resources in here. So that is available for you. Um, did you want to say anything about um, tech sets there, Becky, real quick? And then I was going to pull up one um, additional resource that's mentioned in C3WP, and that's the They Say I Say Templates. But Yeah, um, and I'm glad you brought up They Say I Say Templates um, because I do use those um, as part of their counter argument in their paper. Um, those are amazing. Um, I start every single, um, every time I create a new unit for writing, um, I tend to quite often um, blend uh, informational reading and informational writing with my argument stuff quite a bit. Um, so anytime I can take a look at what the C3WP has, um, if I'm looking to make a new text set, a lot of times I start there and see what I can find um, before I move on from it because they, I know they already have like really good vetted sources that um, are already gonna do some of the things that I know I need to teach my students um, how to do. So it's been, um, it's a great robust resource. Um, like Jeremy said in the chat, it is something to bookmark um, and come back to. A lot of this stuff is very, very um, teacher friendly and it's very, very student friendly as well. Yeah, so you hop into any one of these and then they'll have additional resources for you, including all those text sets. I can't quite remember, is there a list of just the text sets somewhere on here? I There might be, I can't remember. I think I found it this summer um, when I was looking and building another one, um, but can I find that at this moment? Probably yeah, not. I was gonna say, I don't know if there's just a list of the text sets um, that are available, um, but also there's uh, you know tips for creating a text set. Cool. The other thing, and thank you, yeah, for those of you who are starting to drop your notes in the chat as we're coming to a close, we'd love to hear what you're taking away from the conversation tonight. Um, the other thing, and I don't have a copy of the book right handy, it's probably over on my other shelf, but um, many of you who are maybe taking a writing class or recently have taken a writing class um, have experienced the book They Say, I Say by Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein. It's probably in like its fifth edition right now, super popular. You know, some instructors are like, here, go read this. Um, and you're like, oh, what is this? I don't understand how to use it. But this great resource, it was compiled by um, Dave Stewart Jr., who's another teacher colleague here in Michigan. Uh, I think it's fair use, educational copyrighted. It's fair use that he copied all of the uh, sentence templates out of They Say, I Say, and just put them into one clear, concise document. So as you're introducing different concepts to students, you can have them come in and quite literally copy the template. So, um, hey, we're trying to introduce the counter argument. Um, let's use this template. Of course, such and such is would certainly take issues with the argument of such and such, um, you know, or nevertheless, critics of such and such will probably argue such and such. And so these uh, template sentences are ones that students can quite literally put into their own writing and then build from there. Like, I think you called it uh, adding a little bit of flair earlier, uh, Becky, when you were talking about your, your students. All right. Um, so yeah, just to kind of close uh, out, um, closer look at crime and puzzlement book. That's great. Uh, let's see, that was from Nadia. Jenna is saying, um, really loving the interactive activity. That could be a lot of fun. Um, other things, love the activity, use it in my classroom. Cool, thanks Grant. One of the things we're doing in our breakout room too is we turn we turned on the annotation tools in Zoom. So if you're doing this as a remote lesson, you know you can start like highlighting and circling things. Uh, we were doing that on our uh, uh, the PDF in our breakout room. It was kind of fun. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and you know feel free to um, to reach out to to Becky or I on Twitter. Uh, we're not trying to like get Twitter followers, but if you need help with something, please let us know. Um, we are more than welcome. We are more than willing to help you in any way that we possibly can. Um, and um, I think that there is one more slide um, at the end of our presentation 
um, that we're just going to uh, sh kind of share some dates with you um, in terms of what's going on for the webinar series. Uh, I know that we want to make sure that you are aware of what's coming up. And so November 16th is our next webinar uh, that we're going to uh, be having. And then uh, you can see the rest of the dates there. And then Troy or Becky, I don't know what else you would like to say to kind of wrap this up. I just want to say thank you for being here and thank you for being such a wonderful yes. um, audi engaged audience um, and thank you for your kind words. Um, I know a Tuesday night in October is, <laughs> um, is busy for everybody. So uh, thank you for taking a little uh, time away from your busy lives to be with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. And I will, um, you will now be spammed by me for the rest of the year. <laughs> I will send you the recordings and I'll send you the updates for the upcoming webinar sessions as well. And uh, thank you again to all of you, especially the pre-service teachers who joined tonight and yes. well, many familiar faces and friends who joined in as well. We appreciate all of you and wish you a great evening. Take care, everyone. Thanks.